maybe we get into the introduction of the biographies. So Jennifer's kind of hosting this seminar with us. So we've got uh, Jennifer Lee is a reader in the School of Social Policy and Social Science Research at the University of Kent, with a particular interest in using embodied, reflective and creative practices for social justice. Her current work includes addressing and highlighting experiences of marginalization in science due to intersectional factors, including disability, gender, race, and caring responsibilities. Her recent books are Women in Supermolecular Chemistry, I hope I pronounced that, Supra, sorry, Molecular Chemistry, Collectively Crafting the Rhythms of Our Work and Lives in STEM, uh, 2022, The Policy Press, Embodied Inquiry Research Methods, 2021, Bloomsbury, Ableism in Academia, Theorizing Lived Experiences of Disability and Chronic Illness in Higher Education, 2020, UCL Press, and Conversations on Embodiment Across Higher Education, Teaching, Practice and Research, 2019, Routledge. The next book, Boundaries of Qualitative Research with Therapy, Education, Art and Science, will be published by Policy Press in 2023. Wow, so I'm quite impressed with uh, Jennifer's uh, range of books as well. And then um, Amy Grant is Wellcome Trust Career Development Fellow and Senior Lecturer in Public Health at Swansea University's Centre for Lactation, Infant Feeding and Translational Research. Amy's work has focused on the marginalised pregnancy of motherhood for the past decade, including mothers on low incomes, living in stigmatised locations and disabled mothers. In 2019, Amy was diagnosed as autistic and has incorporated the study of autistic pregnancy and early parenthood into her research, including her Wellcome Fellowship and the research she will present today on media representations of autistic mothers. Amy is the author of two books and documentary analysis methods, Doing Excellence Social Research with Documents, published by Routledge in 2019, and Doing Your Research Project with Documents, published this year by Policy Press. Right, so now I'll, I'll hand it over to Jennifer and Amy for the seminar. Thank you. I think my role here is to do an introduction um, and you'll kind of hear from the work that I do that I'm not really a documentary researcher. I was thinking, I don't work with documents at all, which that isn't actually strictly true. I guess a lot of my research is around generating documents and generating artifacts that I will then analyse. But what I do, um, avoiding saying doo-doo, because I can always hear the voices of my children saying, you just said doo-doo. Um, what I actually do is uh, I teach research methods and I teach research method design. So when I first um, read Amy's last book, the Doing Excellent Social Research with Documents, I was uh, just about to teach um, two on two courses which were aimed at master's students. Um, one was specifically research design and one was around different qualitative methods for social research. And I also offered to review Amy's book and I was very kind of nervous about this because I like Amy and we're friends and I wanted to like her book and I was really worried that I wouldn't like it. So you can imagine how happy I was when I read this book. And not only did I, I like it because it was so accessible and easy to read, but because even though it was about doing document research, doing excellent document research, it actually went into all of the um, all of the ideas behind research design, which I think are absolutely essential for doing any kind of research, whether it's with documents or, or any other method. And it was absolutely fantastic. And I wrote I wrote the review and I actually got told that I had to be more critical because I couldn't just say how marvelous her book was. Um, they wanted me to present a more balanced view, which was hard because I thought it was a marvelous book. Um, with this second book, what I really treasure about it, and I was rereading it last night and this morning, um, and I also gave it to a new PhD student of mine to read on the plane on the way home yesterday, is that it is aimed at people who are so new, not only to researching the documents, but to research. And I think that is where it's so incredibly valuable because it doesn't just take you how to do or what document research is or tell you about document research. It tells you how to do it. And it tells you how it fits into the bigger picture of research design, of thinking about theory, of thinking about ontology and epistemology and thinking about research questions. And further than that, it also helps people in terms of how do you then craft a methodology chapter. So where does the, the kind of nuts and bolts of doing research, how does that then translate into the written product? And as such, I think it's absolutely fundamental and not just for people who want to research your documents but to be honest for anyone who wants to do any kind of research at all i think amy you should probably write this without the document 
bit, but because it, I have to say, and again, I'm just being far too full of superlatives, it is without doubt the best book I have ever seen for students on how to do research um, for your dissertation or master's project. And as you say in the book, it is useful still for PhD students, especially if they're new to this particular area of research. And I'm hoping I'm not taking away from what Amy's going to say um, when she goes into the book, but I think at the, at the very end, in the conclusion, um, you wrote that you aim to enable students completing a dissertation using documents as data to better understand both the process of undertaking research with documents and how to write the dissertation. And I think this is exactly what you've done. You have made it so that you can take someone by the hand and whether they've got a good supervisor or not, and you even talk about supervising and, and what that should look like and how that should be, um, that they will be able to use this book and then craft not only their research, but how they design it, how they take and undertake it, how they collect those documents, and then how they conduct that analysis and write about it from start to finish. So I think it is absolutely awesome. And I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you so much, Jen. That was incredibly kind and lovely. Um, I'm going to share my screen now so, um, so you can all see the presentation. So let me uh, put that to full screen. OK, so hopefully now you're able to see um, like the main screen without the notes. Can somebody confirm that's worked? Yes. Brilliant. Okie doke. And the way my computer has gone is I can't see anybody now. Um, so do feel free to uh, to interrupt me with a comment if needed at any point. So um, I won't introduce myself again uh, because George gave such a lovely introduction earlier. Um, but the useful thing on this slide is my Twitter uh, username, as long as Twitter doesn't implode. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to send me a message on Twitter. I'm at Dr. Amy Grant. Um, and later on, I've also got some other ways you can uh, can keep in touch about my work. So then moving on to the next slide, um, for anybody that hasn't bought the book yet or who might want to share a link with friends, um, Policy Press gave me a discount code to go with the launch. So there is 50% off if you use the code uh, POSR50. Um, and if you have any problems with that, just give me a nudge and uh, I'll let them know. So that lasts until the end of the month. So I thought rather than just talking about what the book is covering, because actually, you know, that's kind of quite, quite hard to cover in a short amount of time. I thought I'd give you a couple of the top tips that are in the book. Um, so thinking about choosing your research question um, and really some, some key fundamentals to doing your research well. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk you through um, a research project that I've been dabbling with in the background for the last year, um, where I'm looking at the, the different representations of autism mums, as they're known, or moms. Um, so that would be the mum of an autistic child versus autistic mums who are uh, autistic people who are a mother. Um, so I'll talk you through that in terms of the importance of the area, how I picked my data sources, how this all fed into my research questions, and then thinking about the database I used, and then the way that I screened my documents, um, and then a little bit about kind of describing the data that I found, and then my findings. And then I'm going to end with a few methodological lessons, um, but this will be reasonably tight to, uh, to make sure we've got room for some questions at the end. So, um, the first thing that when I was um, putting together the proposal for this book um, that I found um, 
was something that didn't really suit me in traditional kind of how to do your dissertation books is that idea that you read the literature and then you spot a gap and then you fill the gap with some data um, and somewhere around that point you kind of think of your research questions um, and I actually think that when we're thinking about documents rather than perhaps going out and generating new data through interviews or observations or using creative methods. Um, what we're doing here is, is much messier. Um, and so sometimes you'll you'll be reading and actually um, I've got these little sketch notes on the screen because I've dotted them through the book as kind of key points to uh, to focus on when everything is just feeling hard with your research project. So first of all, I would say to read widely around your subject area, to not get too hemmed in with disciplinary uh, boundaries. Um, and then the next point really is on the right hand side of the slide. So to be curious when you're looking at documents themselves. So my thought is that you can come to your research questions which are absolutely fundamental and which impact on every chapter in your dissertation from either the reading on the left of the screen or the documents on the right hand side of the screen so we don't know what came first the the research gap or the documents and it really doesn't matter so even though we have to write them in this sort of uh, you know standard format where you talk about your literature and then your methods and then your findings actually it's okay just to be really messy um, when you're coming to your research question but that doesn't mean that that kind of methodological messiness is okay not to try and constrain in some way so the the first uh, sketch note on the slide uh it shows a little dog buried in papers and things and and right you know furthest away from the dog is one is a paper that says the one um so you know as was mentioned earlier having a document identification number is really helpful so sometimes when you download documents from databases they'll come with an id number but actually they're often quite complex so you might just want to start you know from one to to 200 or, or however many documents you have um and you can then even though it is a messy process and it's difficult to keep a handle on. And the next image uh, says research diaries are your friend. And actually, I would really, really uh, emphasize the importance of keeping notes as you're going through. Um, because when you write up, you are going to need to make it all look neat and tidy. Um, so out of the complexity and the mess and the reading and the documents and the potential research questions and the policies and things that make it important, you will be able to pin it all down if you just keep notes. And they don't have to be anything fancy. Um, you know, most of my research diaries are, you know, I, you can see on my desk here, I have like multiple pads of post-it notes and I'll write things on them. And at the end of the day, I'll stick the post-it notes in my research diary in a way that kind of makes sense. And I might sometimes add some extra stuff. So your research diary doesn't have to be beautiful. It just needs to, to remind you of why you made decisions. And so, as I mentioned at the beginning, it can be quite dry talking about research methods in the abstract. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview from a, a project that I've been dabbling with. You know, it, it's nothing to do with my day job, but it's something that as an autistic person, I, I find uh, the tension between uh, parents of autistic children and autistic adults uh, in terms of discussions about what research should be done and um, what policy should be, how services should be set up. Um, and often the voices of parents of autistic children are privileged over and above those of um, autistic adults who have that experience. 
So on this slide, um, I, I've got a definition of an autism mom. So it's a term that parents of autistic children have started to use or do use to find their community. Some people love it and see autism mom as their identity. Others hate autism mom and think it's offensive. Um, and actually, you know, quite often you will see uh, autism moms wearing T-shirts that say, I'm an autism mom. And, you know, effectively they're outing their child as being autistic, which is a very stigmatised diagnosis. Um, so thinking a bit more about the importance of this as a research area. Um, I'm autistic myself, um, and if you want to know more about autism from autistic people, you can search on social media for the hashtag actually autistic. Um, and you know, and people tend to be very, very open. Um, and also, as well as being an autistic person, I'm an autism researcher. Um, when most autism researchers are not autistic. Um, and, and we come from our research from different places. Um, so most autism research is quite deficit focused. Um, and that's because of the stigma that's traditionally been associated with being disabled, which I think has slowly decreased. But the stigma associated with being autistic is still very much there. As I mentioned on the previous slide, we've got that real tension between autistic adult advocates who many of them won't have a formal education in terms of a degree or a research qualification. But my goodness, they are determined and the amount of knowledge they have means many would be able to get a PhD very, very easily without having to do too much more. The symbol that I've used on the right hand side of the slide is the autism infinity symbol. So it's often seen in a rainbow gradient or in gold. But the symbol that autism moms like to use is the puzzle piece. Um, I haven't put it on the slide because it's actually kind of seen as a hate speech uh, symbol. So similar to a swastika. And that's because of research talking about eugenics. So trying to abort autistic fetuses before we're born um, and research that talks about aiming to cure autism, even though 80 percent of autistic people wouldn't take a cure if it was available. Um, and instead, autistic people say that they want research to be on our quality of life. So not about stopping autism, because actually we think it's really valuable. Um, and this is kind of the context that autism moms are based in. So my own research um, has started looking at the experiences of autistic mothers and other gender identities who have had a baby. Um, and it's really, really limited. There isn't much there. And quite a lot of it is done through this deficit lens. Um, when I searched on Google for autism mom, so the parents, I got uh, 10 million hits. But when I searched for autistic mom, I got 2 million. So it shows that, you know, the the attention is not being drawn towards autistic parents in uh, in common culture and media at the moment. So I started uh, thinking about what possible data sources could could help me to to unpick this area that I was interested in. So at this stage, I didn't have a research question. I didn't know what data I was going to use, but I knew that so many autistic people found the autism autism mom uh, stereotype as something really offensive um, and that actually it appeared that many parents of autistic children, particularly women, were really living up to these offensive stereotypes. So I thought about this in terms of what the phenomenon I was interested in um, was. And actually, it's am I thinking about autistic parents? Am I thinking of autism moms, the non-autistic parents, or am I thinking of both? And I thought, actually, the really important thing there is to amplify what we know about autistic people who become parents. Um, and that's specifically thinking about birth parents. 
thinking about a literature gap, actually there's almost nothing written and, and what's written about popular culture is, is almost entirely missing. Um, and that made me decide that I really need to centre autistic people in my research uh, that, that I was doing here. So then thinking about potential data sources, so thinking about things that are just out there in the public domain, I was thinking about social media. So, you know, there are a lot of social media communities that autistic people gather in. But actually, that didn't feel very ethical to me because people were were talking about things that they wouldn't have talked about in a more open public space. Um, and even perhaps on a Reddit community, which would be open for anybody to read, the expectation wouldn't be that that would then end up going into research and possibly resulting in a media article um, that could then potentially harm autistic parents. Um, so things like having their children taken away do come up in, uh, in the research on breastfeeding um, that, you know, that autistic parents, uh, when dealing with health professionals, uh, have that kind of hung over them, that threat that, you know, we might refer you to social services if you don't do what we say. So, you know, it, it's a really sensitive area. Looking next at thinking about kind of official documents, policy documents, uh, clinical guidance, there is almost nothing there, so that there just wasn't enough data. And that then led me to thinking about media. So I thought uh, potentially about representations in film and TV, but so often those are written by people who aren't autistic and they're very rarely played by autistic actors. So I thought that that wasn't going to give us an authentic way in. So then I was thinking about more kind of uh, first person accounts. Uh, so in terms of news, uh, documentaries, radio. And because this was an unfunded project, I actually thought going for, for news would be the easiest way of doing it. So at this point, I started thinking about what my research question and analysis strategy will be. And as I describe in the book, actually, your analysis strategy fits with your research question, because if you're doing really in-depth analysis, you need less data. Um, if you have the same amount of time, you know, it just makes sense that the more in-depth your analysis strategy, the smaller your sample should be. So my research question was, how are autistic mothers portrayed in print media internationally? And because I'm thinking then about print media, the focus is on words. Um, often you don't get the images that go along with those news articles um, in the, the news databases. So discourse analysis was a natural uh, kind of approach for me to consider. But within the social context of there being a lot of stigma and discrimination, I thought that using critical discourse analysis would be uh, would be more important. So really thinking about how people are represented and then calls to action is a really important thing in critical discourse analysis. Um, so you're you know, you're looking for very specific things and unpicking those. And as I've said already, the implication was with that approach, I needed a reasonably small sample size. So at this point, I started database searching using LexisNexis. Um, and what you can do when you're doing documentary analysis is you can have a fiddle around with your parameters before you finalise what you're intending to do. So I went into Lexis um, and I decided to include all countries, any time period. And I thought about the different words that could be used. So autistic mother, mom, mum and ma'am. And you can see there on the slides that I got different numbers of hits for each of them. And then the next thing that you're doing when you're doing a documentary analysis is removing irrelevant content. So things that don't match with your research question. 
but actually that's quite hard to decide what is irrelevant and it's not really well covered in the literature I would argue. So thinking about my screening then, so in terms of the unique uh, results that I got, I had 225 articles um, and you can download from Nexus so it goes into an Excel spreadsheet for you. So what I tend to do is I take the first few columns where I'm getting um, the name of the article, the, um, the publication it was in, uh, the date it was published, and I'll take those few articles out, those few columns out, put them in a new spreadsheet, add a document identification number so I can always tie the notes in my research diary to what I've been doing based on the spreadsheet. And then I added a new column for, yes, it's definitely uh, going to be included. No, it's not relevant or it's a duplicate. And then going through this um, and thinking about what wasn't relevant helped me to shape my inclusion and exclusion criteria. So within medical research, it's really, really common for people to need to outline this in advance. But doing documentary analysis, I think it can be much more organic and you can get to know what data is there and then you can make the decisions. So of my 225 sources, over 100 were about a film where uh, the protagonist was autistic. But that wasn't really relevant for me. And then there were a few other TV or films that were described um, in 24 articles. They were only talking about autistic children. Um, and going back to the big box on my screen, my focus is the autistic mums. So in 19, there was like one sentence that would just say the mother was autistic and they wouldn't say anything else about it. Um, and some were irrelevant or incomplete. So in addition to those ones that weren't really relevant, some also weren't pre print media. So I had some partial TV transcripts and a radio transcript. So out of all of that, I had dozens of messy pages of notes in my research diary. So, you know, going back to my post-it note, why don't I like ID number 27? What is it about it? And you can go back and you can process. Um, and in the end, you can get to this kind of list that you're not necessarily going to get there at the beginning. And so I had 31 left. So in terms of describing what is left, um, it, it's common in a dissertation that, for example, if you did interviews, you would have a table that described your participants. And I think this is really, really valuable in documentary analysis as well. So uh, in my table, I had the year of publication and I had no articles before 2007 and they slowly increased over time. So in 2020, there were nine articles. In terms of country, almost all of them came from the UK. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? What is it about autism mums that's more interesting to the UK media than elsewhere? And then I also made a note of any publications that had more than one article, um, but only two publications had three articles. So that was The Guardian and The Observer at the weekend um, and The Mail Online. And so then thinking about doing the analysis itself, um, there are questions about whether you do it by hand. So printing everything out or putting it into something like Envivo or Atlas. Actually, I did both. I printed them all out. I had them clipped together with a bulldog clip. They're all in order of their document ID number. And it was the sort of thing that I, I picked up and I scanned and I, I looked through for different things at different points. And then I, I put it into Envivo when I had an idea of what I wanted to be looking for. So on the screen, you can see there um, that descriptions of people was one of the things I had. And I had descriptions of the child and of the mother. Um, and you can see there that I've got a, a range of 
of words and terms um, that I, I generated inductively, as is common in a, a discourse analysis. Um, and also um, I had language that was focused on autism as well that you can't see on the co on the uh, screenshot of my coding. I also had descriptions of events and of the autistic mums involved in those events and calls to action. Now, these next slides, I'm going to go through quite quickly, um, but these will be available afterwards if you'd like to see them. But basically, autistic mothers were portrayed almost exclusively negatively. So they were disabled, failing as mothers, they lacked empathy. And out of all of my 31 uh, articles, most of them having multiple bits of data coded, there was only one positive example um, talking about a remarkable tenderness between mother and child, which in itself can be seen as ableist because it assumes that an autistic mother wouldn't be tender or have a bond with her child. So thinking then about the language that was used to describe autistic mums, we have them described as being vulnerable, bad at parenting, including in one instance, a mother who was a teacher. This is a qualified teacher who looks after probably 30 children all day, every day, um, who's considered to be bad at parenting. And then there was quite a lot of discussion about children being removed. Um, so court cases being described. And there were also links to some external factors. So the photo on the page uh, comes uh, from a, a TikTok video a mum put out when she was told, an autistic mum, that she had to leave a, an amusement park because her shorts were too short. And this was talked about loads in, in multiple different uh, publications. But we have factors like poverty, needing to mask their autism, so pretending to be neurotypical, and then interactions with the police being banned from places and child abuse. Um, so we have a lot of these kind of negative events as well. Thinking about the parents of autistic children, they were portrayed as young carers, resentful and being harmed, including reports of child abuse um, and one child who died. Um, unfortunately, the child uh, had been playing with curtains in their bedroom before and there was concern about the child getting harmed. And so the curtain had been replaced with a, a sheet, so a, a you know, some bedding going up and over with the idea being if the child pulled on it, it would come down. Social services had seen it in the past. No one had commented on it. But actually in this article, the, the harm was related to the mother being autistic. So that's a really short whistle stop tour of my results. Um, but some of the method methodological lessons that I think we can pull out there are really that the data we choose really impact on what we find about a phenomenon. So you need to be really clear in describing why you chose that data set and also the potential limitations of that. Um, so obviously using media sources, things tend to be very black or white, you're, you're good or evil in media reporting, you know, they're quite sensationalist, even in broadsheets. It's also important to consider how close the data source is to your population or phenomenon of interest. So actually here, most of what was in those articles didn't come from the autistic mothers, it came from the media. So that's okay because I'm talking about how the media stigmatize autistic people, but that's not quite so good in terms of thinking about how autistic mums see themselves. As John Scott says in his 1990 book, uh, we really need to consider the motivation of authors on how things are described. So here, the journalists are trying to sell papers. The editors that are editing the content will make it more sens sensationalist because that sells. 
And as I said right near the beginning, you need to keep really detailed notes to help justify your decisions when you're writing up. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, I'm going to give a few quick reminders before we move on to questions. So the first reminder is Sophie Payne Gifford will be joining us next week. Uh, sorry, not next week, in our next meeting, which will be on the 25th of January, talking about using government inquiry documents in research. So thinking about COVID there. Um, so that there will be some description of abattoirs, um, but there won't be images of that. So that's just something to be aware of. So it would be great if you can make it along. Um, and going back then to my reminders, um, you can sign up to our mailing list so you get reminders and invites to meetings at documentsresearch.net. Um, we're looking for presenters for February and November next year, so otherwise our programme is full. So if you think that you might be ready to present, let us know. And here's another reminder for our um, discount code from Policy Press for my book. Uh, let me know if you're struggling with that. And as well as the Documents Research website, you can follow my work um, on Facebook. I have an open group uh, called Dr. Amy Grant Autism from Menstruation to Menopause, which is the name of my welcome eight year fellowship. But I'll also be sharing methods uh, information. The Documents Research Network also has a Facebook group. So do apply to uh, or, you know, do request to join that. And if you want to contact me, uh, Dr. Amy Grant on Twitter is probably the best way to get me.